The International Ozone Association Pan American Group is pleased to present on oxygen and ozone safety. This presentation is intended to provide general ozone and oxygen safety awareness and guidelines for use by organizations with employees working with ozone and or oxygen. Training for employees should also include site-specific considerations for ozone and oxygen systems, as well as any additional relevant local, state, and federal requirements. The learning objectives for this presentation are to help those listening to understand characteristics of oxygen and ozone and their related hazards. This includes gaining an understanding of oxygen concentration for normal and oxygen-rich atmospheres, gaining an understanding of the three components of the fire triangle, understanding the eight hour and 15 minute ozone exposure limits, understanding the ozone oxygen mixture characteristics relative to air, and the difference between ozone measurement units of percent weight and part per million by volume. Within this presentation, we'll also gain an understanding of safe working practices around oxygen and ozone and understand how to find an oxygen or ozone leak. We'll start out with oxygen safety considerations. Uh, within many of our ozone facilities or within our ozone facilities, oxygen is the feed gas uh, to our ozone generators. Um, so it is important to understand first the characteristics of this feed gas uh, before it even gets to our generators. The oxygen gas characteristics include that the molecular formula of oxygen is O2. It has a boiling point at one atmosphere of negative 183 degrees C or negative 297 degrees Fahrenheit. The liquid oxygen to gaseous oxygen expansion ratio is approximately 1 to 850. Oxygen gives no warning in that it is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. And gaseous oxygen from liquid oxygen is heavier than air and may accumulate in low-lying areas. Um, as you see on the right here, we've got the large liquid oxygen storage tanks and there are some um, ambient vaporizers where the conversion from liquid oxygen to gaseous oxygen occurs. Uh, many of the facilities, if, if you're using a um, gas diffuser type facility, uh, many of these facilities are driven off of the pressure accumulated within those liquid oxygen tanks. And as you can see with uh, the negative 297 degree Fahrenheit boiling point, uh, that vaporization process or that process of converting from liquid to uh, gaseous oxygen occurs um, readily within, the, within these uh, processes through these ambient vaporizers. At those uh, liquid oxygen facilities, you'll often see a NFPA 704 placard, uh, which is related to the hazards affiliated with the liquid oxygen. Uh, it covers the health risk, the fire risk, the stability, and also the characteristic of that liquid oxygen. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is the blue part of the symbol, which represents the health risk. Um, oxygen gets a three rating, which indicates short exposure could cause serious temporary or moderate residual injury. Um, the red part of the placard indicates fire risk, and oxygen has a zero rating, uh, given that it is not flammable. The yellow part is related to stability, and oxygen also has a zero rating on this, since oxygen is very stable. And finally, the OX on the bottom of the placard indicates that oxygen is an oxidizer, uh, which may lead to fires burning more vigorously. Now, taking a look at some of the specific liquid and gaseous oxygen hazards, um, liquid oxygen does pose some special concerns, uh, one of which is the higher density of oxygen can make many things combustible that would otherwise not be combustible in air. Uh, it can result in explosions in extreme situations, and freezing can burn the skin with the cryogenic fluid. Um, so if you get exposed to the liquid oxygen itself, uh, it could burn your skin uh, through freezing. There is another freezing concern with uh, use of the cryogenic liquid oxygen that oftentimes you see freezing on the exterior of the pipe. Uh, so when working around that pipe, if you are in extended contact with that frozen pipe, uh, it could also lead to burning skin by that, mean, that those means. For gaseous oxygen, uh, if we look at gaseous oxygen, you'll see that it can occur in many locations throughout your ozone facility. Uh, so the conversion of ozone of oxygen to ozone is only um, converting approximately 10% weight to ozone. So the remaining 90% in that gas stream will be oxygen. So even on our ozone piping throughout the facilities, we still have the oxygen safety concerns present throughout the facilities. With this, the primary concern with gaseous oxygen is, of course, that increased fire risk. Let's talk specifically a little bit about liquid oxygen deliveries and some safety elements around these deliveries. 
Um, so liquid oxygen deliveries will normally be performed by a truck driver who is an employee of an oxygen supply company. Uh, that truck driver will park the truck, uh, check the tank, um, connect up his hoses as appropriate, open valves, and load the tank. Uh, the on-site plant staff will normally verify liquid oxygen delivery is scheduled prior to allowing the truck in the gate. They'll accept the bill of lading, certified LOX tests, and weight tickets at the gate. They'll identify to the truck driver which tank to unload into, and they'll observe the completed deliveries. Um, with this piece of the um, work of maintaining these tanks, uh, owners have a few different options and, and do take some different options for managing safety around liquid oxygen systems. So one uh, approach that some take is that they'll fully contract out the full liquid oxygen system. So the oxygen supplier will own the tank up to the vaporizer um, and will operate, maintain, um, or will own and, and maintain that system. Uh, so that the plant staff does not have to do anything with liquid oxygen or any have any potential exposure to liquid oxygen. In some facilities, even when the owner um, or the municipality owns the system, uh, they'll contract out to the oxygen supplier to maintain that oxygen system uh, up through that uh, vaporizer, again, to avoid having their own staff working on cryogenic systems. And then the final approach um, is that many times the owner owns the liquid oxygen system, their staff is trained to deal with cryogenic systems, and the oxygen supplier uh, is truly just coming in, checking the safety of the tank and delivering to the tank. Uh, so there's different ways and different uh, levels of um, health and safety exposure associated with the different methods. Now looking at an oxygen-rich atmosphere, uh, the normal oxygen content in air is 20.9% by volume. OSHA defines an oxygen-rich atmosphere as being something greater than 22% by volume. Now, oxygen itself is not flammable, but in oxygen-rich atmosphere, risk of ignition and fire is significantly increased, and it will vigorously accelerate combustion. If ignition occurs, the reaction can vary from slow combustion to violent explosion. The initiation, speed, vigor, and extent of the reaction depends largely on the concentration, temperature, pressure of reactants, and the energy and mode of ignition. Sometimes materials that will not burn in air can burn vigorously when in oxygen-rich atmospheres. And also the resulting fire is much hotter and will pro propagate at a much greater speed. Um, it is important to check local codes for standards that pertain to oxygen-rich atmospheres. To better understand uh, the characteristics of fire, we are going to take a look at the fire triangle now. There are three components to the fire triangle. Oxygen is just one of those three. Um, the other two components are fuel, which could be an organic material, ferrous metals, or in, in many other things, and ignition, which can be caused by flame, static electricity, sparks, ferrous metal, contact, heat, and other things. If one of these elements is missing, the fire will not occur. Uh, so in the design of these systems, it is important to try to manage to the extent possible and minimize the presence of a fuel or the presence of an ignition source when we're in the vicinity of our oxygen storage uh, facilities. Um, typical causes of oxygen fires um, include oxygen, enrich, uh, oxygen enrichment of the atmosphere, improper use of the oxygen, incorrect design of oxygen systems, incorrect operation and maintenance of oxygen systems, or use of materials incompatible with oxygen service. Um, one thing, uh, you know, in, in the design of oxygen systems, one thing you see often is you want to minimize your organic material that's within the vicinity of your oxygen storage tanks. So oftentimes you'll see, uh, even in a facility that may use asphalt paving around the majority of the facility, when you get in the vicinity of the oxygen uh, storage tank, you'll see concrete used uh, to avoid that organic material in the vicinity of those tanks. You may also, um, you will also see um, no smoking signs regularly posted around your oxygen systems uh, to try to eliminate that ignition source. So one example of an uh, oxygen enriched explosion. Uh, this happened at an ozone treatment plant. Um, on the left hand side, you see an ozone destruct system before the explosion occurred. And then on the right hand, you see it after the explosion occurred and debris scattered around in the, the vicinity. Um, what happened on this one is that there were actually hydrocarbon components in the polymer being used in the upstream processes within the treatment plant. Um, those, those hydrocarbons uh, built up over time on the destruct catalyst, 
um, ultimately providing an unknown fuel source within the catalyst. Um, so the combination of that fuel source, those hydrocarbons, the oxygen component of the off gas, as well as the heat from the catalytic, or catalytic reaction in the ozone destruct system, ultimately it, it fulfilled those three components of the fire triangle and led to an explosion at this facility. So a few things to avoid, um, taking a look at the incorrect design, operation, and maintenance of these oxygen systems. Uh, one thing to, to avoid is rapid opening or closing of valves. Um, also, that they can rapid opening and closing of valves can lead to pressure swings. It uh, can create an ignition, ultimately create an ignition source within the, the process. Um, excessively high gas velocities um, are another thing to be avoided. Poorly located vents. So within the system, of course, on the liquid oxygen system, you, you don't want to trap liquid between two closed valves. That doesn't have a potential to, to vent because as that liquid heats up, it's going to expand and may ultimately um, lead to uh, potentially bursting the pipe if uh, you exceed that or leaks on uh, flanges within the pipes as that pressure rises. Um, it, it is important not to work on pressurized systems to make sure any before we do any work on liquid oxygen or gaseous oxygen systems that we take the system offline, purge, uh, relieve the pressure before we do any work on it. Um, it's important to avoid venting into enclosed areas or confined spaces in which there's a potential to create an enriched oxygen environment. Um, also, it's very important to keep your systems clean. Um, as we mentioned, the, the fuel source um, being organic materials, other materials, uh, greases, things of that nature, oils. Um, if you have a dirty area and then you have an oxygen leak, you're, you're fulfilling two of the components of that fire triangle. So it's important to, uh, to the extent possible to minimize contamination in the vicinity of oxygen areas. Um, also very important to avoid incompatible materials in the design, construction, and maintenance. Um, pipes, fittings, or pertinences need to be cleaned for oxygen service and sealed properly. A very important step when you're first constructing your facility or when you're replacing equipment on your facility is to ensure that it is appropriately clean for oxygen service so you don't, again, introduce a fuel source into your oxygen system. Finally, it's important to use only spark-free, non-ferrous, clean tools that are dedicated for work on ozone and oxygen pipe fittings and appurtenances. Um, it's important to label these at your facility, make sure they're, they're clearly labeled and kept apart from other tools and make sure not to mix other tools in with them um, to ensure that your maintenance staff and everybody working in, on or around your oxygen systems are safe. One more note on the ignition sources, just going into them in a little bit more detail. So of course, open fire or flames are ignition sources. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's, it's important to have the no smoking signs and to actually enforce that in the vicinity of your uh, facilities and in, in the vicinity of your ozone and oxygen facilities. Um, it's also very important to notify any um, maintenance staff on staff that's working on site or contractors coming on site about the hazards of these facilities as welding um, in the vicinity is an open fire or flame source. Um, Additionally, electrical grinding or frictional sparks can be an ignition source. So again, um, working with contractors and maintenance staff on site uh, to minimize any kind of grinding or, or potential sparking that could occur within the vicinity of these facilities. Um, heating by compression uh, can be a fuel source um, that could ultimately, or an ignition source for these um, that could ultimately lead to a fire. Friction or mechanical impact. Um, high velocity in the presence of particles, so the collision of particles can create an ignition. And then static electricity is another potential um, ignition source. Looking specifically at some elements for protection of your personnel, uh, it's important to shut off uh, your oxygen feed, evacuate areas, and ventilate areas in the event of a leak. Uh, before re-entering those areas, ensure that the, the environment is no longer enriched uh, to, to keep your, your staff safe. Um, clothing selection, so select materials to minimize combustibility. Avoid synthetic materials uh, when working around um, liquid oxygen or gaseous oxygen. Uh, flame retardant clothing may be helpful, but it can still burn vigorously. As we mentioned earlier, um, if you have an oxygen enriched environment, uh, things that wouldn't typically burn can still burn vigorously in oxygen-enriched environments. Uh, wear clean, well-fitting clothes that can easily be removed. 
And if you are exposed to an oxygen enriched environment, avoid flames, sparks, electrical or battery operated devices. Change your clothes or ventilate your clothing and air for at least 15 to 30 minutes um, to try to, to mitigate and, and reduce and eliminate that oxygen enrichment. Here's one example of um, personal protective equipment uh, for use around liquid oxygen. Uh, we don't often have to work around open liquid oxygen. As we mentioned, the delivery dri drivers for the trucks are the ones connecting up and loading the tanks. Um, when we do have leaks on the system, it is important to isolate um, at the tank if possible and not work when there is a leak in progress. Uh, but if you are working in the vicinity of a uh, liquid oxygen system and there's concern for the hazard, um, this represents uh, appropriate um, personal protective equipment. As you'll note in this pic picture, he does have a face shield on. He does have um, closed toes boots. He has a apron on as well as um, cryogenic gloves, so heavy, heavy gloves uh, to protect his hands and his skin um, from any exposure to liquid oxygen. In the event that uh, there is a leak, uh, the emergency response would, of course, first shut off the source of oxygen, um, notify the appropriate um, emergency response facilities and follow your emergency response and fire response plans. In appropriate firefighting media, um, now in the event, ideally the fire department will respond and it's not necessary for your staff to respond. But in the event that uh, there is a small fire that needs to be addressed, um, some appropriate firefighting media include water, dry chemical powder, or carbon dioxide. Within our ozone facilities, it's important to have monitors in the appropriate locations to um, increase the safety and, and just notify us in the event of oxygen leaks. Uh, the recommendation is that two monitors be placed within the ozone generator rooms. And then it's more facility specific when you get beyond that, but also place in other indoor areas where pressurized oxygen piping occurs. Um, so you can distribute them around the facility as appropriate in rooms that have oxygen piping traveling through those rooms. Um, a high alarm for to indicate an enriched environment uh, occurs at 22% by volume, and that can activate beacons with alarms. And then a high, high alarm would be at 23% by volume, it's typically at 23% by volume, and that can activate an ozone system shutdown with alarm, and typically it will trigger an isolation valve to close back at the liquid oxygen storage tank to close the, the feed supply all the way back at the, the beginning of the process. So for oxygen leak detection, um, if you can look at your tank or your liquid piping, and you can visually, many times you can visually observe, you'll see kind of a smoke looking um, material or a, um, fog coming off of it as that liquid oxygen drips out or leaks out and vaporizes into the air. Uh, the key is to turn off the oxygen if necessary and contact the supplier for repairs on the liquid oxygen side of the system. Uh, for gas piping, you can spray, uh, it, you, you won't have that same cloud or, or evaporating uh, oxygen coming off of it, so you can spray a uh, deionized water or soap solution. If you if you suspect a leak, uh, you can spray your flanges or spray um, where you suspect there's a leak uh, to indicate if there with that soap solution to indicate if there is a leak. It's important when you're doing this to have a portable oxygen gas detector. Uh, ensure that you're not going into an enriched environment yourself. Um, sometimes uh, the ambient analyzers are further away, or if there isn't an ambient analyzer in the room. It's important to carry with you a portable oxygen gas detector. Uh, you can use that sometimes as a sniffer uh, in the vicinity, but the soap spray also works to kind of really pinpoint that leak. Um, and then repair using proper tools and safe practices. So for a summary of our oxygen safety considerations, uh, ensure that all people, anybody on site are expected to work on the facility uh, with oxygen are properly trained and informed regarding risks of excess oxygen. Only use materials and equipment approved for use with oxygen. Never use replacement parts that have not been approved and cleaned for oxygen service. Only use spark-free, non-ferrous tools for maintenance on oxygen, ozone pipe, and fittings. Wear suitable, clean clothing, free from oil, grease, or other combustible contaminants. Never use oil or grease to lubricate oxygen equipment. And verify that all fire extinguisher equi extinguishing equipment is in good condition and ready for use. 
additional uh, summary items, smoking is strictly forbidden in areas where oxygen enrichment is possible. Or when working in confined space where oxygen is used, isolate equipment, provide ventilation, and use oxygen analyzers. Entry shall be only be, permit, be allowed by permit issued by a trained responsible person. Do not enter oxygen enriched atmospheres to rescue burning victims. Victim may be hosed with water from safe distance and rescued when ambient oxygen is below 23%. If exposed to oxygen in a rich atmosphere, avoid flame or any ignition source until clothing has been properly ventilated. All oxygen apparatus and equipment must be properly identified and escape routes must be maintained clear at all times. Uh, there's additional oxygen safety information available. Um, of course, consult with the oxygen safety data sheet. Uh, your, your oxygen supplier should be able to provide you that. Um, your oxygen supplier is also a good source of, of information. Some of them have additional safety provisions or things that they want to see the, the plant staff do uh, before they will even deliver to your facility. Uh, many of the much information is available through Occupational Safety and Health Administrations, the National Institution for Occupational Safety and Health, also the Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety. And then finally, there are a lot of regulations covered in the Compressed Gas Association documents uh, covering oxygen, cleaning equipment for oxygen service, oxygen pipeline and piping systems, oxygen-rich environment atmospheres, fire hazards of oxygen and oxygen-rich atmospheres, as well as several videos, AV1, AV8, that include more information on oxygen safety. Now we're gonna go ahead and move into ozone safety considerations. So some of the characteristics of ozone gas include its molecular formula is O3. Uh, it is invisible at normal concentrations. Ozone is heavier than air with a specific gravity of about 1.1 at 10% weight of ozone product gas. Uh, so when we talk about 10% weight ozone product gas, if you have a, a liquid oxygen fed system, the remainder of that, the 90%, remaining in that is, is oxygen. So just a, a note relative to safety is that even when you have gone through your generated generator and you now have ozone, you still have to consider oxygen safety provisions on that ozone piping uh, since we do have a significant amount of oxygen still, still present. Uh, the gas, ozone gas decomposes slowly to oxygen molecules. It, at very cold temperatures of negative 25 degrees Celsius, that half-life is weeks to months. Um, but at 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, the half-life decreases to a matter of days. And at 70 degrees Celsius, so at, at high temperatures, it can it further reduces to as low as two hours. Um, so we, I've seen this in my experience already that ozone can persist in the gas phase. So you may have a poor ventilation in a contactor gallery if you have an ozone leak. Sometimes it may take some time to get that out if you have failed ventilation or or a corner that is not well ventilated, ozone sometimes can migrate into a low sump and stay there for an extended period of time. Um, so see the safety data sheets for more information on the physical characteristics. Ozone does have a pungent odor, um, and it is important for operations and maintenance staff to become familiar with the smell of ozone. Um, some potential sources or uh, possible sources of ozone smell that, that we're familiar with that you may smell periodically include lightning strike, uh, there's a the process of printing equipment also gives off an ozone smell. And there's been uh, uh, noted that noted by one of the members of IOA that ozonated olive oils, um, which you can buy on Amazon, uh, there's some of these that actually do uh, hold in that ozone smell. So you can actually use that to get an idea of what that smell, the ozone smell is. So looking at the effects of ozone exposure, uh, the detectable odor level or at the point at which most people can detect uh, the presence of ozone is 0.01 to 0.04 parts per million by volume. Uh, so at a very low concentration, most, most people can pick it up and smell it. Once they're familiar with it, they, they know uh, what ozone is. So, so it's a, a low detection limit. Um, now the next, the next one on this line is the um, threshold limit value, time weighted average. So it's looking at an eight hour exposure. And what this is really looking at is it's the level which a worker can be exposed to day after day for a work, working lifetime without adverse effect. So we're looking at eight hours a day for a lifetime. The level um, that's defined for that is 0.1 part per million by volume. Um, 
above that, once you get above 0.1 ppmv, uh, you can experience headache, shortness of breath. And then the next uh, OSHA-defined limit is our threshold limit value for short-term exposure. So this is looking at a 15-minute exposure level, and it's the level which a worker can be exposed to up to four times per day with at least a 60-minute time period between exposures without experiencing, it's experiencing an adverse effect. So that um, TLV, STEL, is defined as 0.3 ppmv. As we increase in concentration, um, what may occur is chest pains, dry cough, lung irritation, and severe fatigue. Uh, when you look at 0.6 to 1 ppmv for a one to two hour period. And then once you get up to five parts per million by volume, it's immediately dangerous to life and death. And then above 50 or at 50 ppm for a 30 minute exposure, it, it is expected for it to be fatal. Looking at our ozone systems that we would typically see at our facilities, uh, let's talk a little bit about the gas phase ozone concentrations that we experience around the facility. Uh, so the schematic here on the right side of the slide, you see an oxygen supply that uh, goes through a vaporizer, feeds our ozone generator where we produce the ozone. Coming out of the generator, you see um, typically we produce an around or designed for around 10% by weight ozone. Um, this could vary during operation for anywhere from 3% weight up to 14% weight, depending on the design and the, and the application needs. At 10% weight ozone, you see that we are at 66,500 ppmv. Um, from there, we dose the ozone to the ozone contactor um, through either bubble diffusion systems or side stream injection systems. Uh, much of the ozone is transferred into the water. However, a little bit does um, exit the water, uh, either into headspace or into um, air relief um, or means of separation, separating out that air. In that off-gas stream, um, it's, it may be around or typically be around 1.5% weight. So you still have a very high concentration in that off-gas stream. Um, so that off-gas then travels through your ozone destruct, uh, which breaks down that ozone. And then your vent gas, so you're looking to destroy all the ozone, but the vent gas typically is, is less than about 0.07 uh, ppmv. Um, so, you know, key things within your piping, within that, that main piping um, coming out of your generator, extremely high uh, concentrations. Um, and then if you consider, so this is looking at an oxygen fed system. If you consider an air fed, the oxygen is about five times higher than the air fed. The air fed would more, more than likely be more like 2% weight, which is about 13,300 ppmv. And then your off gas stream, as I mentioned, is still a very high concentration. Um, so the key to all of this is, you know, in reality, we're monitoring ambient and we're looking at our first alarm level is at 0.1 ppm feet. So a very low level for our first alarm. So very small ozone leaks may quickly cause high ambient ozone conditions. Um, it is another key element is before doing any work on these systems, it is very important to purge piping generators and contactors uh, before that maintenance occur. Uh, you know, do appropriate lockout, tagout procedures to ensure that you won't produce ozone into a space that anybody's working in. Um, and even if a facility has been offline for, you know, a few days, it's still important just to, to exercise that extra caution and take a uh, ozone monitor with you and monitor before opening or entering a space uh, to ensure you don't have an unintentional exposure of a, of a staff member. So talking a little bit more about the, the exposure hazards and the health effects. So your acute health effects or your short-term reversal of reversible effects um, it can include irritation to the throat, respiratory tract, lungs, cough, chest pain, wheezing, headaches, and shortness of breath. Recovery usually occurs within 1 to 48 hours, depending on the severity of the exposure. You may also experience pulmonary edema which is fluid buildup in the lungs. This may occur and might be delayed for a few hours after exposure to high ambient ozone concentration, so greater than one ppmv. Uh, you may also experience vomiting, passing out, bloody nose, and other symptoms uh, that have been reported due to short-term exposure to very high ambient ozone levels. For chronic or long-term effects, the long-term exposure to ozone greater than 0.1 ppmv or short-term exposure may lead to some reduction of lung function. Um, at the moment, medical study evidence is still inconclusive regarding respiratory and other health impacts of long-term exposure. However, it, it is known that frequent and long-term exposure to ozone should be avoided.
First aid for ozone exposure uh, includes moving immediately to an area where ambient ozone is less than 0.1 ppmv and breathe fresh air. If assistance is necessary, responders should use the proper PPE if the ambient ozone is greater than 0.3 ppmv. Uh, seek immediate medical attention. Call 911 if breathing is difficult or stopped or if other ozone exposure issues occur. Uh, if necessary, perform CPR if breathing has stopped. Um, compressions, open airways, etc. Um, and then always follow your on-site safety policies, which could include notifying the on-site health and safety officer. Within our ozone facilities to ensure the safety of staff, um, it is it's recommended or it's, it's recommended that a minimum of two ambient ozone analyzers are included in the ozone generator room, so that in the event that one ozone analyzer is out of service for maintenance or has failed, that you'll still have one other analyzer. Um, place these analyzers in other locations around the facility where you may have ozone product gas. Uh, so anywhere you have ozone piping running through that may have a flange that starts to leak, um, or even in the event that you have your ozone residual analyzers, if there's any potential for off-gassing off of those residual ozone systems, it is important to have these safety analyzers around the facility. So your staff doesn't inadvertently walk into a space that has high ozone exposure. Um, your monitors should be located to account for your HVAC flows. Uh, so if you have an exhaust fan um, pulling air from the top of the room or, or pulling the air from, or blowing, blowing air from outside or into the room, depending on your ventilation, um, it's important to look at those air flows and, and evaluate, will, if I have an ozone leak in this room, will that, ozone get to this ambient monitor or does the HVAC system somehow impair that uh, flow from that uh, so that you get a real, realistic account of what's going on in the room. Uh, within the facilities, high alarms are typically set at 0.1 ppm uh, and that can activate a beacon and increase ventilation rate within an area uh, with that high alarm. And then high, high alarms are typically set at 0.3 ppm, which can activate an ozone system shutdown uh, to protect your staff and ensure that that leak doesn't uh, spread further within the facility. Uh, it's important to maintain and calibrate these analyzers to ensure the safety of the staff and make sure that appropriate fire code requirements are met. Um, one note, which I'll address on the next slide, is when setting that high alarm, although it is typically 0.1 ppm, it's important to look at what the typical ambient background ozone level is in, in the area. In considering background ambient ozone levels, some utilities have had to adjust that, that ozone alarm, that low limit, that uh, high alarm, uh, to higher levels to prevent ozone generator shutdown due to elevated ozone levels from air pollution. Uh, so in some metropolitan areas, um, the ambient ozone on ozone days, ambient ozone can get pretty high, and it may exceed that 0.1 ppm threshold. Uh, so it's important to, to consider that. Uh, when setting those alarms. Down below, we have, on the on the bottom of this picture, we have um, a view of a ozone um, warning that occurred relative to the Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, back in the 2002 timeframe. Um, so there used to be some significant ozone events occurring with this, within this area. And as you can see on this figure, it reached levels as high as 0.15 ppmv. Uh, there are many ozone systems around Dallas. Um, so that Look at your metropolitan area, look at what the ambient um, ozone is, and make sure that you set those levels appropriately. Potential sources within your facility for high ambient ozone. Uh, so just looking around the facility, we, we kind of already reviewed uh, the concentration in different components of the piping within the facility. So we know, we know there's quite a few places where you have, do have high concentrations that would trigger high ambient ozone. Um, specifically looking through this list, the off-gas release from the contactor headspace through pressure vacuum relief valves due to high pressure conditions that might occur during rapid increase of water flow rate and level in the contactor. So on ozone, typical ozone contactors will have on the far upper right picture here, will typically have a vent stack that includes a pressure and vacuum relief valve. Uh, the pressure and vacuum relief valve are often um, for the purpose of protecting that contactor structure because uh, the, the physical structural design is not made to have vacuum or uh, pressure imparted on it above a certain level. So you will have this pressure vacuum relief assembly uh, to protect that structure. Um, ideally, this system stays closed 
Um, but there are conditions where if you have a destruct failure and a pressurization of the headspace, or if you have a rapid change in water level uh, that displaces air, it could overwhelm the capacity of the blowers on the destruct units if they're not sized to accommodate that, and it can push um, ozone gas out of these stacks. Um, oftentimes, these are located on top of the contactors, so it's just good for maintenance personnel and everybody to be aware while working on top of these contactors uh, that you could have vent situations um, where ozone is pushed out of these towers. Ozone is heavier than air, so even though these things are often elevated up, up pretty high in the air, if there's not a good wind blowing to take that away, then it may drop back down onto the surface of the ozone structure, uh, which creates potential exposure location. Um, another potential source of high ambient ozone is leaks from fittings, valve stems, and other connections on ozone gas piping. Um, ozone gas piping is, is predominantly made out of stainless steel, but there is still some level of expansion and contraction seasonally. Uh, and if that is occurring and there's uh, gaskets in your flanges um, or just even movement of the piping can lead to leaks uh, around valves on fittings within that ozone gas piping. Uh, your ozone residual sample line discharge or sump area in the contactor gallery. While the, the concentration in your ozone in your water is only you know, two milligrams per liter or something in that range, depending on your dose criteria, uh, as you take your samples and run them through your sample analyzers, depending on how that works, if those analyzers are discharging to the floor and, and, and splashing on the floor or going into a, a drain sump, as you agitate that um, liquid and as it's as it's put into the room into an open environment in the contactor, uh, you can get off gassing from those systems as well. And if the contactor area is not properly ventilated, you can have accumulation of ozone from that. Uh, another source is ventilation from areas at contactor outlet or downstream of ozone contactors. Um, so ideally, uh, whenever we run the water through our ozone contactors, before leaving our contactor, we have a zero measurable resi residual. Um, so there isn't as much of an opportunity for downstream off-gassing. However, we have seen in some conditions, even when you record a zero on your residual analyzers leaving a contactor um, downstream, there may be uh, potential off-gassing. So um, some facilities have instituted quenching all the time to mitigate that. Some facilities, it's, it's very much characteristics of the water. Um, some facilities do not have this issue, but it's important to recognize that areas that are downstream of the ozone contactor, so where the water's flowing to, such as filter complexes, things of that nature, if they're in a closed setting, there is a potential for off-gassing, and it's important to um, be aware of that and, and have your operations and maintenance staff aware of that so that in the event that there is off-gassing, they can take the appropriate measures. And then another potential source is... Um, well, it is important that uh, you conduct your ozone contactor, equipment pipe fitting valve, or other maintenance with insufficient oxygen purge. So make sure that you are co conducting those activities with sufficient purge. If you have not sufficiently purged a facility or a pipe, uh, you open a flange, you could ex get exposed, or in, within a contactor, you can open a contactor lid to enter and find that there is still ozone present. So it's very important to conduct the appropriate purges before conducting maintenance. On, on your ozone system. For ozone leak detection, um, there's, there's a couple different uh, tactics that you can take to find a leak. Um, so a, portal, a portable ozone gas detector um, is an effective mean, uh, means to pinpoint a leak or at least get close to the leak. Um, and then to directly identify the leak, it's often most effective to take a clean white rag and soak it with 2% potassium iodide solution um, that the, the iodide within the solution reacts with ozone to form iodine which appears as a brown color on the white rag uh, so that is very effective to really hone in on find specific to find specifically when you wrap the pipe you can find specifically where that leak is occurring um, but be careful when responding to and locating ozone leaks a small ozone leak can cause high ambient ozone conditions in confined areas with little or no ventilation so before entering the area make sure that the ozone concentrations in the area aren't exceeding the levels that we previously discussed. Um, ozone is heavier than air, so higher ozone ambient levels uh, may occur during a leak closer to the floor, ground, or even downstairs on a lower level, a fair distance from the leak itself. So even if it's leaking in one spot, you might find a higher concentration somewhere quite a distance away from the spot of the actual leak. Also, when working in those environments, um, 
if you do enter an environment, you may think that, okay, I'm measuring with my sniffer, the, the concentration is, is good, but then you lean over or reach down to the ground to get something and you could put yourself in a potential exposure situation. So it's important to move your the sniffer or the ozone, the handheld ozone detector around to the point where you're checking towards the floor as well to, to ensure that you have a good understanding of that ozone concentration. Um, a portable ozone leak detector is recommended when present in areas of elevant, elevated ambient ozone because ambient ozone levels may vary dramatically over short distances. So really having an understanding of what the ozone level is right in the vicinity of where you're standing, not just in the vicinity of the ambient ozone monitors mounted within that gallery, within that facility. So in summary, looking at the ozone safety considerations, ozone is detectable well below the eight hour safe limit of 0.1 ppmv. However, due to olfactory fatigue, you may quickly acclimate and not notice ozone odors after a few minutes. Ambient ozone concentrations may vary dramatically over short distances from the leak source. Um, so therefore, handheld ambient ozone monitors are very helpful for monitoring local ambient conditions and limiting personnel exposure. Effects of ozone exposure are a function of time, concentration, pre-existing respiratory conditions, and physical exertion. Sensitivity and acute response is highly variable among individuals depending on environment, genetic, and medical conditions. Some ad additional ozone safety information is available. So you can look at the ozone safety data sheets. Um, so whenever you purchase an ozone system, it's typically in the submittal uh, in the o and manual that comes from the ozone generating equipment supplier. Um, OSHA also has information related to ozone exposure, ozone in workplace atmospheres, and occupational chemical database. Um, the National Institute of Occupational Cell Safety and Health um, also has ozone toxicity information. US EPA has national ambient air quality standards on ozone. And then again, similar to oxygen, the CGA, Compressed Gas Association has some guidance on ozone as well. Um, the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety has various topics related to ozone. And WorkSafe British Columbia has ozone safe working practices. So in review, our learning objectives today were to understand the characteristics of oxygen and ozone and their related hazards. Um, specifically looking at oxygen concentration for normal and oxygen enriched atmospheres. Uh, the three components of the fire triangle understanding the eight hour and 15 minute ozone exposure limits, understanding the ozone oxygen mixture characteristics relative to air, understanding the difference between ozone measurement units of percent weight and parts per million by volume. Um, we also looked at an understanding of safe working practices around oxygen and ozone, and an understanding of how to find an oxygen or ozone leak. I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of the International Ozone Association Pan American Group Municipal, Municipal Committee uh, for developing the content that you saw in this presentation. Also for the IOA PAG support staff for organizing and implementing and encouraging the group to prepare this online training. Just a little bit about the International Ozone Association Pan American Group and the International Ozone Association in general. Uh, the Ozone Asso International Ozone Association is a non-for-profit educational association, um, ultimately focused on knowledge sharing of ozone. So we, we look to really help um, people to understand the many benefits of ozone and to use it appropriately in the industry. Uh, we also serve as a knowledge center. We um, have a technical journal, so ozone science and engineering, and we also have ozone news uh, that keep up with current activities related to ozone. Uh, you'll find uh, if you visit ioa-pag.org, uh, there's many resources within this. Um, with membership, you would gain access to all the past science and engineering journals uh, related to ozone, um, as well as we do organize conferences. Uh, the PAG group, as well as the international group, uh, does conferences to share uh, what's going on in ozone, what's the latest best practices, lessons learned, newest applications, things of that nature. Uh, so please go to ioa-pag.org uh, for additional information. A final uh, disclaimer associated with this presentation, neither the IOA PAG nor any third parties provide any warranty or guarantee as to the accuracy, timeliness, performance, completeness, or suitability of the information and materials found or offered on the site for any particular purpose. 
You acknowledge that such information and material may contain inaccuracies or errors, and we expressly exclude liability for any such inaccuracies or errors to the fullest extent permitted by law. Your use of any information or material on the site is entirely at your own risk, for which we shall not be liable. It shall be your own responsibility to ensure that any product, service, or information available through the site meet your specific requirements. We appreciate your participation in this oxygen and ozone safety presentation. Feel free to reach out to us with any comments or questions related to this training. You can reach us at the contact information below. Thank you for your time.